Um, if you didn't see the preparation, don't worry. You can just take a couple of minutes now to take some quick notes. If you cast your minds back to the workshop and one of the activities that we did was the weather report. Very simply, if you haven't done it already, just draw three columns on the page in front of you. And on the left hand, just note down all the things that are currently going really well for you. You know, stuff that's being successful, that's flowing beautifully, that's not taking a huge amount of energy from you. In the middle, I want you to think about the things that could do with some improvement. You know, they're going okay, but they need a little bit of uh, a nudging from you, shall we say. And then on the right hand side, these are things that really do need your attention, but for whatever reason you're not getting to at the moment, they're really at the forefront of your mind or, or perhaps you're trying to forget about them. Um, but the stuff that's really not going great at the moment. So I'm just gonna give you a, a couple of minutes to, to jot those thoughts down now. In the meantime, I'd like to welcome Simon. Uh, I'm taking the back seat today and Simon's going to be hosting today's webinar where our focus is on resilience and performance. Uh, I know many of you have met him um, and for others of you who worked with me on the, the workshop itself, uh, you'll be meeting him for the first time here. So welcome, Simon. Thanks very much, Nikki. And uh, well, yes, welcome everyone. It's great to get to, uh, to talk to you all again. As we did last time, uh, we'll be asking you some questions as we go. So uh, we'd like you to uh, answer some of those in the in the chat field. Uh, so just be great if you could get that open first and foremost. If you take your cursor to the bottom of the screen, you'll see a bar pop up. You click on the chat to open that up and you'll be able to submit your thoughts there. Uh, again, if I could just ask you to make sure you've highlighted the, in the two field, all panelists and attendees, we can then make sure that everyone can see everything that's being shared. Throughout the session, again, you can also submit questions in the uh, Q&A field and then we'll have some time uh, at the end of the session as well for you, uh, for us to answer those. So today we're here obviously to talk about uh, resilience and performance and research shows that there are clear links between our levels of resilience and our ability to maintain peak performance. So that's the purpose of today really is to ensure, uh, to explore what those links are and uncover a range of strategies that will help us to maintain our balance and performance. I think we might be having a technical issue here. Simon, have you got your mute on? We're not hearing you at the moment. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's Hello? perfect, great. Ah, oh, sorry, I don't know, where, where did I cut out, Nikki? Just as you went into talking about the agenda. Ah, so I think we can okay. see it all there beautifully in front of us. Lovely. Well, that is, in fact, what we're going to be doing today, looking at what it takes to create that mindset, uh, what depletes us, what re-energizes us, and where can we get that support that we need to help us. The programme that we're talking on about today is, of course, creating the future together, and that together element is a key element to, to, uh, to all that we're doing here. We're not alone. And... Uh, understanding how we can rely on others to help us to succeed is one of the key uh, components of what we're doing. So why are we talking about this? You can see up on your screen a whole load of stats that, um, that I've drawn from the press recently that mental health is one of the real, real big stories of, of, our, of our day and you can see here how that mental health situation plays out in a workplace scenario. And it's, it's hardly surprising when we think about it, about how busy our lives are, both at work, at home, and trying to fit in all of the stuff that we have to do. No, it's not su no surprise that many of us feel close to feeling, bur to, close to burnout at times. 
So strengthening our resilience drives how well we do what we do and how much we enjoy it. So it's worth taking a moment to look at how we can help ourselves and our team reach that peak performance. In fact, one of the things that we've talked about a lot throughout the programme is taking that time to stop and to question our, our, ourselves. And of course, that's, this webinar is another opportunity to do that. What decisions are we making subconsciously that are affecting our ability to perform? So what do we mean by resilience? Resilience is the capacity to prepare for, to recover from, and to adapt in the face of adversity, stress, or challenge. It's about creating that state of synchronization between what's going on in our hearts and our brains and our nervous system, something that we call psychophysiological coherence. And it's this, it's this approach that creates that optimum performance where the heart, the mind, and the emotions are operating in sync and balanced. When we're in, co in coherence, we can access that deeper mental clarity and emotional clarity that helps us to solve problems better, it helps us to listen more and be pre more present for people and have more energy and ultimately have a more balanced home hormone level so that will have a, a longer term effect on our health as well. And as you can see from this chart here, uh, the, 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 difference, uh, the different states that we can be in have a massive effect on, on our mental health. Obviously, the, the, the peak performance zone is, is where we want to be uh, most, most of our time in our flow state. This is when we feel like we're, we're on fire, we're, on, we're at our best, where everything clicks. Switch too much towards that yellow zone and we start to get bored, we're very low energy and lethargic. And conversely, uh, going over to the, the, to the stressed out red, red zone is obviously where burnout starts to happen. And these are just some of the outcomes for stress. In fact, it's been found that most illness is related to unrelieved stress. And if we spend too long out of that flow zone, stress and its effects can have that real devastating effect, not only on our own morale, but on that of our team as well. Last week, we talked about being emotionally contagious. And when we wear our emotions loudly, others pick up on that emotion. This infectiousness is also subconsciously telling people that, you know, this is an acceptable, a healthy way to work. You know, we lead by example, whether we intend to or not. So the incentive for getting better at handling stress is clear. We obviously need some level of challenge so that we're not bored, but too much and we fall over. It's kind of the Goldilocks effect, if you like. But when we get it right, when, we, when we're in our flow, it's been shown that we're three times more productive. Of course, there's no single level of pressure either that's optimum for everyone. We've all got our own unique requirements. The person who loves to get out there to be at the cold face of the action would be stressed in a job that was stable and routine and vice versa. Even when we agree that a particular event is distressing, we're likely to differ in how we respond physiologically, psychologically to it. But ultimately, we want to focus on getting all of us to spend more of that time into, in that middle zone. Before we do that, we need to acknowledge what our own reactions to stress are. So I want us to do that. I want, us, I want you to take a moment to think of a time when you've been in that red zone. What changes in your body, in your brain, when you think about this stuff? I'll give you a moment just to consider that. Even thinking about stressful times brings them back to us, giving us a little taster of that actual stress itself. One of our team works with a process called heart math, where you're hooked up to monitors which measure your heart rate and your respiratory rate. And just by thinking of stressful thoughts, you can see those rates increase. Here's an example of a, of a chart that traces um, our heart rate over just a, a, a five minute period. Imagine how that frustration line plays out over the course of a lifetime it's it's no wonder that unresolved stress can can make us sick i want you now to switch your thinking from that stressful event to a time when you've been in the green zone what's been going on for you have a, have a think 
I'll give you just another minute. For many of us, it's that, the, that regular heartbeat that we've just seen on the chart, or it might be our ability to think clearly, make good decisions, as we, as we saw earlier, or, the, or that, just that feeling that we've got a handle on stuff, that we can deal with anything that life chooses to throw, throw at us. Even just acknowledging and being aware of those different states can give us the power to do something about it, which leads me to today's agenda. So we're going to look at four different elements, four core components of what it takes to build awareness. And of course, we've, we've started that already. Awareness is that, is that first piece, noticing what's going on around us, inside and outside our heads. Then thinking, how, we can, how do we choose to interpret the events that are happening to us in a more rational way? We'll then move on and look at managing our mindset, how we choose to react or respond to any given trigger and finally support how we might ask others to help us meet the challenges that we face so let's kick off by looking at the awareness piece noticing what's going on around us if we don't have any awareness of that then we haven't really got anything to work with so it feels like the right place to start we tend to pay attention to stuff that really demands our focus the stuff that's shouting loudest on our to-do lists we're always thinking about the stuff that's not enough, that's not satisfied yet. Prioritizing what we lack rather than what we have. When we focus on all the stuff that's, uh, that's on our to-do list rather than those accomplishments, we can create a, an artificial sense of, of being out of balance. But by, uh, by paying attention to what's going well, we can also balance out our thinking a bit more. So where are you choosing to prioritize? I'd like you to go back to that weather report that Nikki mentioned earlier and just look at the three columns that you've got. Where's the balance of the items that you have at the moment? What's your busiest column? If you've got a moment, just, just jot down which column is the, is the fullest one. If you could just jot that down in the chat field for, you, for me. And how does that make you feel in terms of your balance? I suspect for a lot of a lot of you that it it is that that rainy cloud uh, column that is, uh, is 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 the longest because that's the stuff that we tend to focus on. But within with staying with the weather report for a moment and 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 the and the activities that you've got in front of you, which which of those activities deplete you and which ones energize you? I spent last weekend at a, a music festival. I've been working really hard and I had a load of deadlines, so there was quite a strong pull for me not to go. But I also recognised that I wasn't really operating at my best. I was really kind of getting close to the burnout place. So I, I decided actually going to stand in a field with 30,000 people for a weekend might well just be the boost that I needed. People, creativity really feeds me. And actually the fact that I did take that time out and went and immersed myself in the madness and the creativity of a festival has energized me all week. So take a moment to highlight which energy, which, which activities on your weather report energize you and which deplete you. If you just give each one a plus or a minus next to it, I'll give you a minute to do that. How many of you have only listed work-related stuff on your weather report? Who wrote down the fact that your diet's going really well and you feel healthier, or you've been better at taking a moment to step back and take stock each day since we, since we spent time on the workshop together? Work when it's going well may well energize you, but it's not, when it's not going so well, it can also deplete you. So we need to ensure we have a balance of uh, activities uh, in terms of what, what we're doing, how we're spending, investing our time. So I'd like you to also consider beyond the work environment, what else do you do to replenish your energy? How well is that stuff going? Just take a minute to add anything else to the list.
So there are weather report so there are three core elements in terms of uh the areas of, of significant influence in our life our work where we spend probably most of our time our, ourselves what the things that we do to nurture ourselves the relationship that we have with ourselves and our relationships so both our personal relationships and those at work and the stuff that you do for others to to feed those relationships each of us has a different balance of each of those uh, three circles an example here of somebody that's very, very work, work dominated, but this is still finding time for themselves. But the, uh, obviously the relationship circle is something that's less of a priority. Another example here where there's a bit more of a balance between work and relationships. So you can see each of our, uh, of our diagrams would be very different. So that's what I'd like you to do for a moment. First of all, just sketch those three circles. Where, where are you now? shouldn't take you very long and then the next question is, is is to sketch where you'd like to be what what shape would those circles be then and what would you need to change in order to get to that diagram two state it might be stuff that's on your weather report already it might be stuff that you need to add in to your weather report. So just take a moment of thinking of any, any elements that you can do to redress the balance for yourselves. So I want us to move on now to look at the next element, thinking, and how we can start to take control of the narrative that's going on in our heads. This quote that you can see on the screen now by Rushdie, those who do not have power over the story that dominates their lives, the power to retell it, to rethink it, to deconstruct it, joke about it and change it at times, are truly powerless. And it's one of the quotes that I love most because I, I clearly see that our thought patterns can either really work for us or they can get in our way. And we've spent the entirety of our lives living in our own heads. So, of course, many of us have the tendency to believe that our thoughts are the truth. But those patterns of thinking have been shaped by all of the experiences that we've had in our lives. And the stories that we tell, about, uh, tell ourselves about those experiences affect the quality of our thinking. We might have had a bad time presenting to a group once earlier on in our careers or been given a piece of feedback that we need to work on our presentation style. But the story that we might have taken from that is, I'm terrible at presenting, which then creates a level of tension and stress in our bodies so that when we're asked to present, we do, we feel stiff and unnatural. Well, we have a habit of manifesting our thoughts. So we need to be conscious of the stories that we're telling ourselves. What, what, are, we, what are we making harder for ourselves because of the thinking that we're doing, the stories that we're applying to that thinking? So I'd like you to select one thing from uh, the right hand column of your weather report. One thing that you might have been putting off could have been, well, pretending it doesn't exist or being in denial about it. It might have been too big to think about right now. We've got all manner of ways of sweeping things under the carpet, but I'd like to get it out today and I'd like to put it on, uh, under the microscope. Actually, once we do that, we, also, we often find it's not the thing itself, it's the thinking about the thing that's getting in our way. So I want us to just unpick our thinking uh, on that. And I want to introduce you to a, a really simple process that allows us to take control uh, of how our thinking influences our behavior. So all, th all thought processes are kicked off by a trigger. Stuff happens. We've got no control of that. What we do have control over is how we react or respond to that. It could be somebody obnoxiously cutting us off, off in the traffic or our computer screen freezing at a vital moment. Whatever that trigger is, that will then provoke a thought in us. A, a thought is kind of an opening a file in our mental filing system. That thought then triggers the story. We don't like to be wrong, so we, we, we create a story to gather evidence that supports that thinking from the world around us, from all, all of our own experiences. And it's that story itself that then creates the, the feeling in us, be that anger or happiness or what, 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 whatever way we feel. But that, it's the feeling itself that then drives a certain form of behaviour. 
So, for example, you might have a, you might, there might be a conversation that you need to have with your boss about a deadline that, uh, uh, that you're going to struggle to meet. That's the trigger. That's the situation that you're facing. And the thought that you're, face, you're facing is, well, I'm, I'm going to fail. The story becomes all of the evidence that I gather to prove that thought correct. How the last time I didn't make, meet a deadline, my boss went crazy. She really hates uh, being late. And I start to awfulize that story. My story blows everything out of proportion. It's, it's interesting now to know how quickly we can, uh, we can go from zero to 60 when we allow the, the, uh, the story to dominate our, our, our thinking. It might just be the fact that our computer screen is frozen at an inappropriate moment, but our story can catastrophize all of that for us. The feeling then in, in that instance then, uh, when I am uh, afraid to open up to my boss and share what's, uh, what's going on, that I might miss my deadline, is the fact that I start to feel stressed, I start to feel tense. And then I start to avoid the conversation, I start to try and brush it under the carpet, busy myself with other stuff, actively avoid my boss. I'm already creating excuses for myself, I'm, I'm not sleeping. The thing is that, you're the one that's controlling that process. No one's forcing you. So we can create better, more helpful thoughts, better outcomes by, by changing the stories with, that we tell ourselves. A healthier way to handle that trigger might be that uh, a, a more of an acceptance of reality. It's okay not to meet all deadlines. I meet most of them, and, and there are other priorities right now. My new story is that my boss will understand she recognizes the priorities that, are, that and the pressure that I'm under and the standards that I try to uphold. How does that thought make me feel? Well, I feel more relieved. I feel eager, more eager to speak to my boss and uh, I look forward to kind of scheduling time to get that conversation out the way. So I, I feel I, I start to handle the situation rather than trying to avoid the situation. So I want you to have a go at this for yourselves. Whatever you've identified on your weather report, I want you to put that front and center of your focus. What are your thoughts around this? How might you be awfulizing that through story? What feelings is that creating for you? And how is that making you behave? How could you trigger healthier thoughts about that situation? How could you change that story? I'm going to give you just a minute to work through that for yourself. So I'd like to move on to talk about the third element, mindset, and how we can choose to react rather, choose to respond rather than to, to, than to react. And for all the planning that we can do, sometimes we do get caught up in, our, in reactions. Sometimes we've all got our triggers. We've, often for me, it's when I feel that something's unfair I feel, like we feel when, we, when we have that trigger, we feel a sense of threat and as we've been conditioned to do when we feel threatened, we are faced with the choice of either fight or, or flight. But there is another choice. It's about choosing whether we react instinctively to the perceived threat or, tap, or we choose to tap into our mental capacity and respond, respond rather than react. It's about consciousness and choice, which comes back to the awareness and the thinking elements that we've just talked about. In fact, managing our mindset is all about awareness. It's about being open to the possibility and choice rather than being at the mercy of our reflexes. Of course, sometimes that can be easier said than done. I was having a conversation last week about uh, a particular issue with one of our app development team. And one of them said to me, I don't know what your problem is. Lack of empathy is a trigger for me. And after a two hour conversation, I was tired and it took every bit of energy I had not to react <laughs> to that statement. My rational brain can see all kinds of possible explanations. It was a language barrier. He genuinely didn't understand the problem. But in that moment, my instinct was to react. And that reaction probably wouldn't have been very pretty. I'm sure we'd have ended up in an argument. 
I had to use every bit of training in my arsenal to breathe in to what he said, to observe it rather than to take it personally, to allow it to filter through to, our, to my more rational brain. So I'd like us to do an, an exercise now. And I'd like and to do that, just, just get comfortable in your chair, sit back, make sure you've got your, your feet on the, on the ground. I want you to think of a time or a person or a situation that's provoked you to react rather than to respond. What happens for you when that happens? Where in the body do you feel that stress? A lot of the time for us, it's, it's underneath the rib cage in our stomachs or in our throats. I want you to be in that situation, connect with that feeling, thinking those stressful thoughts. See that person if it's a person that you're thinking about. Focus in on that sensation, on the way that he, she, it makes you feel. And imagine that sensation moving out into our bodies. Instead of the little knot that it might be in our, below our rib cage or wherever, wherever we're feeling it, imagine it spreading out. Through our, uh, through our chest and down our arms. As you're spreading it out, the sensory experience changes. It becomes less of a stressor and more of an energy. It dilutes the intensity. It's like pouring water into blackcurrant squash. Feeling that level of tension or reaction in our body is not a nice sensation and it can be almost like an out-of-body experience in times we feel our bodies reacting in a certain way but feeling but we can feel unable to control it allowing us ourselves to sit with that feeling and to try and disperse it through our bodies enables us to to move through it and to neutralize its effect so we can prepare for this if if there's a certain person that triggers us and we know that we're going to be in a meeting with that person that always presses our buttons. We need to work out how we can build our muscle to manage our response rather than being at the mercy of our, of, of, of our reactions. Sometimes one of the greatest things that, uh, that, that I, I can do for myself is actively applying kindness. What's the most generous interpretation you can offer as to why this person is as they are? Reactions are really depleting to our energy reserves, so, so, so out of proportion with the situation often. And, and many times they're, they're driven by our own fears and ego, so it's really important for us to, to try to manage them. They can be potentially career limiting if we don't. So I want you to think for a moment of that time, that situation, that, that person that provoked you to react rather than respond and, and what happens for you. You've probably already got that in your mind. We spent a little bit of time on, on that already. Where, where the stretch is here is focusing in on what we can do when, when, these, when these situations happen. What could you do differently to anticipate, to mitigate these situations and avoid them having a negative out, outcome? I know for me, when I do end up having an argument with somebody, that argument sits with me for days. I, I, I hate that level of stress and tension in my body. So it's definitely something that I, I actively seek to avoid. So the final section that I want to talk to you about today is around support and how we can ask other people to help us to meet the challenges that we face. Because resilience is about knowing when to ask for help. So look at the stuff in the center and in the right hand side of your weather report and identify which of those elements could you ask for help with. when we're in that reactionary, ego-driven, fear-driven place, often tends to drive us to disconnect. Ironically, when it's the time that we most need to connect. Google did some research into what makes effective teams. 
as effective as they are. And the number one reason that they found from researching all over that the Google empire was, was psychological safety. Teams that were able to speak openly and honestly with each other were the most successful teams. I read recently the research in, the, that's come out from hospitals as well of the, of the same situation happening in, uh, in operating theatre, for example, when nurses don't feel able to speak openly and honestly to the doctors, the rates of uh, medical malpractice go, go sky high. So it's something that NHS are paying a huge amount of attention to right now. But it's important to, uh, to think about how you're role modeling this, uh, this psychological safety, this need for help and support and openness and honesty yourselves. As I said before, we're, we're leading by example whether we choose to or not. Think, think back to those uh, fear reactions as well that we spoke about earlier, the fight and the flight. Those two are obviously well known, but the research is also showing us that there are other reactions as well, freeze and flock. And we're herd creatures. Flocking is useful to us in times of stress and strain and change. Birds, when they, when they feel threatened, they, their fear response is to, is to flock together, to create confusion for the threat. We belong in communities, but when we're trapped in our artificial fears, we, we forget the useful impulses to come together. We see it happen in, in major tragedies. We saw it happen in Manchester. We saw it happen in the aftermath of Grenfell as well. We saw people coming together. But when we're feeling that our own, when we're dealing with our own issues, we feel that those are, those are more personalized to us and therefore we kind of forget to ask for help. In all of the hard work and planning that's gone into putting this Creating the Future Together program for you, one of the most overriding pieces of feedback is that it's good to know that I'm not going through this on my own. We're programmed to share our experiences. So how, how do we make sure that we can do that? How do we make sure we ask for help? One, may, one way that makes it easier for us to ask for help is to offer it. When we offer help, we earn the right to ask for it. It's the law of reciprocity. We, we don't like to uh, receive something without giving it back. It's the it's, it's kind of an essential law of nature. So be generous with your own offers of help and then you'll have the, the support that you need. So that just about brings us to uh, a close for uh, the for what we wanted to cover today. I just wanted to uh, open the uh, the floor to any questions, anything that I've spoken about over the course of the, today's session that uh, you'd like to know a little bit more about or uh, or anything. Nikki, have we got any uh, any questions coming through? So uh, there's nothing there at the moment. Um, <clears throat> I'll give people um, a few moments to consider any questions that they've got. But actually, Simon, one of the things that I've been thinking about as you've been talking was actually a conversation that I had the other day when I was running a team session with the leadership team. Um, and we had a really interesting discussion about lunch times and about how we don't have lunch times anymore. People don't take a break to stop and eat. And one of the, the participants was saying, talking about when he worked for a French organization. And so when he would go to visit them uh, at, you know, 1230, everything stopped. Everybody went out and they had lunch and they sat down and they talked and they they got to know each other and they still sometimes talked about work things, but actually they talked about them at a different pace and with his observation was with more creativity than they did when they were locked in a meeting room. Um, and I was just thinking about that conversation in relation to what you just talked about there around Google and psychological safety and how we can encourage high performance within our teams by setting a culture where it's permissible to you know do something like simply just take lunch but maybe taking lunch together and seeing what that does to the way that that we bond with each other and understand and build trust and therefore safety with each other i certainly know for me when I'm able to have also that, that kind of social downtime as well as that pressured working time, 
with teams that I've worked with, actually, when the pressure's on, we're able to knit together much more quickly. So intuitively, I think we, we understand the need for having space in our working lives, but somehow we get caught up with the, the fast pace of the work driving us rather than us driving the work. So just a, a something that I was musing on as you were speaking. Uh, there's no more questions that have come in, Simon, so I think we're probably uh, good to continue. Lovely. Thank, thanks, Nikki, and thanks for, thanks for those thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and again, one of the benefits of a programme like Creating the Future Together is to provide that space. So, uh, yeah, I hope, I hope it's, it has been a, a view of help to you. So uh, in terms of uh, just a quick summary uh, of what we've covered, I think it's important just again to reflect back on the notes that you've taken of what we've covered and, uh, and then determine for yourselves what are you going to choose to focus on to practice uh, as we take this forward. We've looked at the, some of the elements here. Oh, sorry, a bit far. I'll get, that, I'll get, there, I'll get there again. Um, so the uh out, out of all of the things that, that we've covered again it's useful just to focus in on one or two of them trying to do everything means that perhaps that's not likely to happen we are, we are all busy people so which which bits out of all of the stuff that we've spoken about today resonate most for you and what are you going to do about it just make yourself a quick note before we before we wrap up So to draw things to a uh, close for you guys, I want to leave you with another, co uh, another quote. There's a reason that the resilience and performance session sits at the end of this phase of the, of the programme for you. That's what it's going to take to help you to really embed change and uh, to manage your own state through change. So I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you for uh, all of your dedication, for your participation in all of the work that we've done so far. Uh, Nikki and I are talking to Kate and the HR team about what the next steps looks like, how we, how we can support you in the most pragmatic and uh, way that's going to really help you to enable you to have those team level conversations and to embed the change as, as, as you go. But for now, I'd like to, uh, to sign off and uh, thank you for your time. Good luck with everything and uh, you know where we are if you need us. Thank you very much, guys.